Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. And thank you for joining us today for this special webinar on five common friction points about Atlassian cloud migration. I'm Abhinit Jha, Senior Vice President at ECOR, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this session. Today, we are here to address five pivotal friction points that organizations encounter during Atlassian cloud migration. Feature priority, downtime, improve security, reduce cost and increase profits, and change management. As we explore these points in detail, we aim to equip you with insights, best practices, and strategies to confidently navigate your Atlassian cloud migration journey. Before we delve into these discussions, I would like to introduce our distinguished speakers for today. They bring a wealth of knowledge and expertise to this webinar, and I'm excited to have them on board to share their insights. Alison and Dave, the floor is all yours. Thank you, Avanit. Hi, everyone. I'm Allison Carlson. I'm a solution architect here at eCore with a focus on the Atlassian toolset. I've been with eCore for seven years. And go ahead, Dave. Uh, thanks, Allison. Yeah. Uh, hello, all. My name is Dave Huebner, solutions engineer here at Atlassian. I've been with Atlassian for a few years, focused uh, primarily on cloud migrations, uh, getting customers that are current uh, Atlassian uh, customers on either data center or server into the Atlassian cloud and working with partners like, like Allison here. Thank you, Dave. I'm glad to be here with you today. So as Abhinit mentioned, these are the five most common friction points that we hear from organizations when we start talking to them about Atlassian migration to their cloud and its feature parity, the downtime that they'll see during that migration, security once they're on the cloud, the cost, and change management when they're on the cloud as well. So one of the first concerns that an organization has when we start talking to them about migrating to the cloud is, will my system work when it's on the cloud? Will the apps work the same on the cloud as they work today on their current server or data center instance? The feature parity is important because it preserves those essential features and functionalities that an organization already has built into their existing instance and are critical to their business. They wanna make sure they have those same features when they go to the cloud. And additionally, this consistency ensures user adoption because we know users are resistant to change. It reduces the time needed for training and it also reduces change management efforts. So let's look into this topic to understand how we can navigate through this challenge. As you can see, when we start talking about feature parity, there are two areas of concern. One is not all server data center apps are available in the cloud. And even for those apps that are available on the cloud, sometimes there's a little bit of differences in the behavior between the way that app works on server and the way that it works on the cloud. And before I go any further, I wanna call something out. When we talk about server or data center, sometimes I may slip and say server, but I do mean server or data center. And that's whether those products are on your on-prem servers or whether they're on another server like AWS. So if I slip and say server, I mean server or data center. So these concerns have a significant impact on the migration process and require a lot of attention. So the way that we deal with this feature parity concern is we conduct an in-depth detailed assessment of all the apps on an organization's existing server or data center instance. The first thing we look at is, is the app even being used? Because if they're not using it at all, and we can tell that by looking at certain features or certain configuration, we don't even bother doing any more research on it. We make the recommendation, you don't need this on the cloud. Is the app available on the cloud? If it's not available on the cloud, we identify if those features maybe are available in native cloud functionality because the cloud has a lot of features that just aren't available in server and data center. Or is there an alternative app in the Atlassian marketplace that has same or similar functionality? And if the app is available on the cloud, we check to see, are those features the same or are they different? Because maybe that app doesn't even need to be put on the cloud. It can be replaced with native cloud functionality. Or is there an alternative app available that would be a better fit for the customer? Or if we just keep the same app on the cloud that we have on server today, we 
do the analysis to see what features are different, what functionality could be different. And then we often have configuration changes that we make after the main migration to ensure that that app is working the as best it can be the way it was working on the server today. And at the end of all this analysis, we create a very in-depth, detailed assessment report that we review with the organization to go over all of our app recommendations, make sure that they're in alignment and are in agreement with our approach. So Dave, do you have any other ideas for how we can help ensure feature parity with the cloud apps? Yeah, I, I do. And I kind of, I think back to, um, to when you were talking about apps not being available in the cloud. Right? And, and what you might do there, identifying the features uh, that might be cloud native. Uh, but sometimes through those, uh, through that analysis, uh, or even an inability to find a, an alternative app, right? you still might not get there. There is power in the customer's voice to speak to the app vendors themselves. Remember that the vendors, that, that, that those apps are third party and th they're third party to Atlassian. And you as customers have have a voice and have some power in that voice to speak to the vendors. And you can work with Atlassian here as well um, to see if that vendor has any plans to move it to cloud. Or uh, if not, if not plans to move it to cloud, maybe that discussion can maybe get them to a point where they do plan because they see some need for it, right? So point being, there's power in, in the customer's voice to, to work maybe with app vendors to get some of that feature and functionality to the cloud. And you kind of along with that, I think of in the feature parity world in general, right? Uh, the opportunity to look at a move from your on-prem, again, server or data center to the Elastic Cloud as more of a migration or more, more than a migration, rather a transformation, right? So you have the opportunity then you as customers, you as Elastic users to really look at your workflows and the way that you're leveraging the different Atlassian um, uh, suite of tools to run your business, right? Take advantage of new cloud functionality and new cloud even um, products, right? To really transform your business. So it's not necessarily just this, I, I'm doing this here on-prem and I want to migrate that to cloud. Rather, I have the opportunity to take a step back and transform the way I do business uh, and leverage cloud in its, in its fullest sense. Really good points. Thank you. So another concern that organizations have is the amount of downtime that they'll experience during the migration to cloud itself. It's a legitimate concern because for many organizations, JIRA, JIRA Service Management, and Bitbucket are mission critical to these organizations. They cannot have an extended period of time when those systems are unavailable. So let's talk about ways that we can minimize that impact. The first thing that we... Um, acknowledge is yes, there's going to be downtime during a server data center migration to the cloud because we don't want users using that server data center instance while we're in the middle of a migration. But what we do is we work with an organization and come up with a strategy to help reduce their downtime and the impact to the business. The first thing that we recommend is a server instance cleanup. So based on what we found during that assessment, before the migration even begins, we recommend that the organization cleans up their existing server instance, such as deleting unneeded configurations like workflows or schemes if we see they're just not even being used. Maybe there's dashboards or boards that no users are using, or the owner of that is no longer with the organization. We recommend that those get deleted as well or removed as well taking care of duplicate users. And what this does is this speeds up the actual migration process when it's being run. The next step is we recommend pre-migrating users to the cloud instance before that migration. And what that does is it reduces the amount of time needed to do that during the migration window. And the last one, very important, I cannot stress this enough, is performing a complete test migration. Sometimes it takes more than one time, it's a test cycle. If there's something that's unexpected encountered, we work through those issues and then we do another migration to make sure that the test migration is going smoothly. This comprehensive testing 
identifies any problems with the migration process or any unexpected issues before we do this in production. It allows the migration plan or run book that's been established to be validated prior to the production one. And lastly, it provides a really good estimate of how long this is going to take when we do this in production. And that's something that we know is very important to organizations so they can plan for their notifications to their users what that migration window is. So how do we tackle downtime? While the test migration cycles are done during the business week, from a test server to a test cloud, for production, we schedule those migrations to the cloud over a weekend to limit the impact to the organization's business. Typically, we do JIRA one weekend, Confluence another weekend to ensure that that migration is complete within that weekend before the work weekday starts um, and limit the impact to the business. Dave, do you have any other thoughts on how we could mitigate downtime? Uh, yeah, you know, we, uh, we, we, we spoke about this earlier, right? Where when we first started talking about downtime, I thought, okay, we're talking about the system going down, not migrating the downtime, uh, I'm sorry, not mitigating the downtime of a migration and the plan that you put in place to like mitigate the downtime as you move from your on-prem into cloud. So that got me thinking about, right, the value of cloud and how that downtime, the risk of downtime, once you're, once you're running your business in Atlassian cloud, you know, is reduced significantly, right? So I think of the, um, the unplanned downtime that unfortunately I've seen, I've had some large customers have to live through when their on-prem, and in this case it was a large data center installation uh, of, I believe it was during Confluence, you know, went down at a very critical time, right? It went down due to, at that point, it was a database server that got all, got all out of line and out of whack, and it took the whole system down. Tens of thousands of users running an on-prem uh, Atlassian installation were down in a very unplanned and chaotic uh, manner, right? That, that, that type of downtime is no longer a concern, or it's much less, much less of a concern as you move into an Atlassian cloud. Right. So in this case, if you are able to kind of mitigate and plan a little scheduled downtime to get from on-prem into the cloud, your overall, um, you know, your overall outlook and emergencies and fire drills of business critical systems going down is dramatically reduced. That's a really good point. So we went from a concern with how do we mitigate downtime during the migration to thinking about unplanned downtime with the current server data center instance. So now we'll actually see less downtime with the cloud. Exactly. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, yeah, it's perfect, right? We think about how we get there and how are we reducing that, you know, there's never a 0% chance of downtime, right? That's why I make sure to say much far, far, far less, right? But how are we, Reducing that and how do we promise that back out to our customers? It really is that resilience in the Atlassian cloud, resilience at scale. Uh, and that points all back to our infrastructure, right? It's enterprise grade infrastructure that is run at AWS, managed by Atlassian, right? So it's a resilient Atlassian cloud hosted in AWS and it's built and operated in a multi-tenant microservices environment. So what is that? You know, what does that really mean? Well, it gives a point to that enterprise grade architecture, which then allows us to really provide the reliability that enterprise customers are reliant upon. Again, they're running business critical systems and making very important decisions based on the tools that they are allowing, really allowing and lasting to host in our cloud. Right. So the high availability that comes along with that um, the the high availability within that reliable infrastructure and failover become paramount. Uh, data recovery, right? The the ability to roll back to it should there be a an unforeseen um, catastrophic event, right? The ability to roll back and recover data from the Elastic Cloud, right? Embedded within AWS comes along with it, and the SLAs, right? different numbers of nines based on the SLA policies that might be subscribed to, whether it's a premium or enterprise uh, subscription, but the SLAs are in place there again on that AWS uh, backbone. And then 
taking it further, right? We'll look at that performance, right? You need that enterprise level, enterprise scale performance. Instead of if you're running on premise, right? Whether it's a server or a data center that you host, you know, maybe in your own walls or data center environment installed within another service provider like AWS, right? You really look for that performance in your current state on prem. You have to manage, you have to scale up and down yourself. With the Atlassian in the cloud, right? That scaling happens automatically. So let's say you add 10,000 users, right? The system will automatically scale up. Or if you reduce and you see that the 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 need isn't there, right? The, the system knows intuitively uh, or based on with intelligent factors in to scale that down, right? So you're going to get that best performance uh, with automatic scaling. A uh, couple other things here that really enable the performance, microservices, kind of shared services across the Elastic Cloud for things like identity and security, right? So you're not just having to have those pieces uh, you know, installed and managed and shared services, those microservices. And for enterprise customers, beyond just scaling up and down, there's the opportunity to kind of scale into unlimited instances. So if you have the enterprise and you know you have 10,000 users, 5,000 users in, in this one business unit or this business line that are going to best maybe operate within their own instance, very easy to put them in their own Jira instance or Confluence instance and have those really those unlimited instances across the enterprise, which has a dramatic import, uh, impact on the performance, right? Of the individual sites. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you. Yep. Um, so next we're gonna talk about another major concern we hear from organizations <sighs> uh, when we go to migrate to the cloud and it's a big one is security. Customers wanna know just how secure will their data be once it's in Atlassian's cloud. When we talk about security concerns, it covers several areas that you can see on this slide. So let's talk about how Atlassian addresses each one of these areas. So the first one's data encryption. Organizations wanna confirm their data will be secure, both at in transit and in at rest. And Atlassian ensures data is secure by encrypting data during transit and that data drives holding customer data and attachments are encrypted at rest. So the way that they do this is all customer data stored within Atlassian cloud products, such as Jira and Confluence, is encrypted in transit over public networks using a transport layer security, which is known as TLS, with perfect forward secrecy. This protects it from unauthorized access, um, disclosure, or modification. And their implementation of TLS also enforces the use of strong ciphers and key lengths. We're supported by the browser. <laughs> Um, the data drives holding the customer data and the attachments uses full disk industry standard AES-256. Um, and AES is advanced encryption standards. The um, data encryption at rest helps guard against unauthorized access. And it also ensures that that data can only be accessed by authorized roles and services um, with audited access to those encryption keys. In the final area, Atlassian uses the AWS key management service, which is known as KMS for key management. So this encryption, decryption, and key management process is inspected and verified internally by AWS on a regular basis. So that's a good thing. The next item, data locations, which is also known as data residency. Organizations want to know where their data will be residing once it's within the Atlassian cloud network. So some organizations have specific requirements for data residency. Uh, we hear a lot from companies in the, organ in the United States that have a requirement that that data that's on Atlassian cloud will be on servers that reside within the United States. So Atlassian offers this data residency for all their cloud plans, standard, premium, and enterprise, so that an organization can specify where their data is located. The next area here, the customer data separation. Companies want to make sure that their data is not being commingled with other companies that may be using Atlassian Cloud or impacted by those companies if those companies have lax security standards. So the way Atlassian deals with this, they have a tenant context to achieve logical isolation of their customers. So it's implemented in both the application code and then also managed um, 
by this tenant contact service. This makes sure that the, the customer's data has a logical separation. So the actions of one customer can't impact the actions of another customer. And any requests that are processed by JIRA or Confluence have a tenant specific view. So other tenants aren't impacted. Um, compliance is a big one. So Atlassian now supports, I'm very happy, <laughs> HIPAA, PII, and GDPR. These are the three most asked for compliance features that we hear from our customers. And um, I know when we started talking to customers a lot about cloud several years ago, HIPAA was not, it was, uh, the cloud was not HIPAA compliant. So um, that's why I'm very excited now that Atlassian Cloud is HIPAA compliant so we can uh, start talking a little bit more to our customers that have those uh, health requirements. Single sign-ons available for Atlassian Cloud products through Atlassian Access, which offers SAML-based SSO, um, where an organization can authenticate their users via their company's identity provider. And it also provides, Atlassian Access also provides, um, the ability to enforce two-factor authentication if they choose to do that. Cloud compliance. Um, Atlassian has compliance with well-known industry standards, such as SOC 2 Type 2, SOC 3, ISO 20001, and 270018, and the CSA STAR. And I've been bantering that term about for a long time, for several years, and I, I looked up to say on this call exactly what it stands for. It's a mouthful. Cloud Security Alliance Security Trust and Assurance Registry. Um, I know it's a mouthful, so that's why we call it CSA C-STAR. <laughs> um, all of these and more are detailed at Atlassian Trust, and the link is on the slide that you can see now, or you could Google Atlassian Trust. It's a great website with all this information. So Dave, one of the areas that I would like you to talk a little bit more about is that Marketplace Trust Program. Yeah, uh, I'd be happy to. So. To put in context, uh, we're, we're thinking back to the those marketplace apps, the third-party plugins. You know, we I've noticed from customer to customer, they may call them different things. Um, the the obvious reason that we would want to talk about the separate is because those are technologies from other vendors, right? Those those folks outside of the Elastian ecosystem, or the part of the Elastian ecosystem, but outside of Elastian's four walls. So uh, our customers then question the level of security requirements that, that we put on them you know, on those third-party apps and what they've implemented themselves. So we do have a trust program in place specifically for those marketplace vendors. Um, and within that trust program, we really look at across privacy, security, reliability, and the support that that vendor might have for the individual app. Uh, and we're able to categorize those four, you know, take a sum of those four categories and give them different levels of certification, right? All, all cloud, right? All cloud vendors or apps that are in the marketplace have to meet at least a minimal set of requirements that we go through. And this is all documented out and in, in charted, I think, nicely within uh, the marketplace site itself. But all vendors have to check at least the minimum boxes on, on all four of those, privacy, security, reliability, and support um, at a minimum. Like that middle tier would be a cloud security participant where the, the vendor does participate in a more robust cloud security questionnaire. Uh, and there's some vetting back and forth to make sure that uh, they have, um, you know, that, that, their, that their apps meet the standards that they say they do, right? So there's some joint testing and, and so on. And then we're able to call them a cloud security participant um, certified app. The highest level that you're looking for, however, would really be a cloud fortified app, right? So any app or marketplace vendor that has apps within our marketplace that has this cloud fortified badge on it, it's very, it's, it's right out there, right in front of you. I think as customers, when they see that, right, they are uh, in, initially, um, reassured that those apps have a higher level of standard applied to them for the uh, for security uh, in all four of those categories. Uh, it could very well be that that actually that app would be built on the Forge platform. So the Forge platform is the same uh, development platform that Atlassian also built apps on. So they're able to intermingle. Uh, we're able to have much more uh, a, a clearer visibility into those security standards. 
and Cloud Fortified is, is really the one to be looking for. Although, you know, you can still feel safe using the other ones because those have gone through uh, different levels of, of security mm -hmm. authentication. So I know I find the Cloud Fortified badge when I look in the Atlassian Marketplace for different apps, I find that very useful. So it's good that we have that. Uh, one more question. Cool. Are there any other areas that you hear about from a security concern standpoint, other than those ones we've just listed on this slide? You know, I, I think about one that's related in a way, right? It kind of relates uh, back a bit to customer data separation. In, in, in your slide here, you're speaking specifically about, you know, different customers separating their data and making sure that one can impact another uh, if there's some security issues in there and so on on the cloud platform. There's another level that some of my larger customers uh, are oftentimes curious about, and that is, that is like data segmentation within their own large organization, right? Because right now within a large enterprise, if you, you could very easily physically separate servers and make sure that this maybe uh, a gaming studio within your large organization can't see what this other gaming studio might be coming up with and, and accidentally release um, um, not accident. Well, hopefully, accidentally, right? Release, <laughs> release visualizations or snapshots, screenshots out into the world, and, and spoil some major Hollywood release. Um, in the cloud, our customers are looking for that same level of security. And and for those that once you get into the cloud and start looking at the organization admin uh, functionality, you can see that an org admin can oftentimes can have access to everything, but you can still shut that down based on kind of site by site permissions, right? So large organizations don't have to have like an all or nothing view into their entire, entire world. They can still have things segmented off in order to provide, you know, um, that extra layer of, 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 of authority internally to make sure users aren't getting at, content that they ne necessarily wouldn't they're still able to wall that off and and run your run with that that sense of security uh, and that's good to hear about the enterprise plans because um when we talk about project permissions oh this person can't access this project we can set up permissions but a lot of organizations are like that just doesn't do it for us we need that segmentation so so mm -hmm. that's really good thank you um the next con uh, concern that we're going to talk about in our list of friction points is cost. When organizations start looking into migrating to the cloud, the first thing they look at is the cost of the licenses. So they do a cost, you know, side by side comparison between what they have today on a server data center and what those same licenses would cost on the cloud. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those cloud licenses can seem more expensive. However, it's important to remember that with server and data center, you're not just paying for those licenses. There's the total cost of ownership. Um, for server data center that includes more than just those licenses. So within the total cost of ownership, we have server cost, and that's the cost of the servers themselves, whether they're on-prem or whether they're in another um, server way to have servers like AWS, and there's the cost of the version-to-version -version upgrades. So for this, um, when you do regular upgrades on your um, server or data center licenses or products, you have time to pay an employee to do those upgrades. You have the time for your employees to spend time validating those frequent upgrades and the downtime while those systems are being upgraded. So all of those things have a cost to them. There's the cost of the infrastructure services and then the server application admin. So organizations have to pay an admin to do those upgrades. So by eliminating the server costs, the version to version upgrades, the infrastructure services, and the server application admin, you can actually reduce the total cost of your ownership and have the added benefit of reallocating those resources that were working on server maintenance to work on other strategic business initiatives. And also, the cloud provides functionalities such as templates that improve team e efficiency. So Dave, what are your thoughts on cost of cloud versus data center? Yeah, I guess I, I would build on your last point there about the additional functionality that's available in, in cloud, right? And specifically like the opportunity cost of, of not making the move to cloud and taking advantage of the significant gains of productivity that your business can have through things like templates, 
automation, those are, those are some of the table stakes. But even beyond that, as we continue to develop um, in the world of AI, right? And artificial intelligence, or specifically we like to call it uh, Atlassian intelligence, right? Generative AI that um, it can help generate stories from Jira epics can uh, start to generate, you know, test cases from 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 user stories and so on, right? So that's the way Atlassian is thinking about that general topic, among other, you know, kind of other areas of intelligence uh, in the direction we're heading, and that's only going to happen in the cloud, right? There's not going to be a retrofit of mm -hmm. AI and somehow we're going to inject that into the data center with you, you know, with allowing an external connection and, and stuff like that. Believe it or not, that question's come up, right? That's only going to be in the cloud. Um, so things, the opportunity that, that those bleeding edge technologies give you back again in productivity, which is really uh, one of the main reasons that anybody is going to, uh, be using it lasting, right? Is to watch the productivity and get improvements in the productivity. Um, again, it's only going to be invested in in the cloud. So the opportunity that might be missed out there by not making that move starts to become really immeasurable unless you start taking advantage of it. And and again, that's just strictly in the cloud. I know that when we talk to our organizations, our own customers lately, there is a buzz with artificial intelligence. It seems to be yeah. on the top of everyone's minds. So it's exciting that Atlassian is rolling that out to their cloud products. Good to sure. hear. So I'm going to uh, digress for a second. Um, we've done four friction points. I'm going to hold on the fifth one because Dave just made some really good points about the benefit to going to cloud. We started talking about the concern about cost, and then it kind of segued into um, yeah, this is actually kind of a benefit, reduced um, cost of ownership. So let's look at what some of those benefits of migrating to the cloud are. Um, as we just discussed, cost reduction, we just reviewed it. Uh, it includes lowering the cost, total cost of ownership and eliminating various server expenses, such as hardware maintenance costs when you go to the cloud, uh, increased profits. So by migrating to the cloud, you can free up those resources that were working on servers before upgrades and maintenance and so on towards other important objectives. And as you can see in this slide, Forrester did an in-depth study of several organizations. They interviewed them um, and they did this huge multi-year study. And they found for those organizations that had moved to Atlassian Cloud, they found 155% ROI and that's just over six months. So improved efficiency is one of the areas we just talked about. Because the cloud provides features like templates and the AI that Dave just mentioned, there's going to be enhanced team productivity by moving to the cloud. And in addition, cloud can provide better network performance. There's uptime guarantees. There's automatic performance upgrades. I know I just was looking at some release notes for this upcoming week's uh, cloud releases and performance upgrades are in there. So it's like nobody asked for it, but they're making performances to how the searches are running. Uh, automatic scaling and load balancing. And then the last one that's on here is the competitive advantage. And overall, a study reveals that 74% of organizations report getting a competitive advantage by going through a cloud adoption. So now we're going to go back to our fifth. Um, away from the uh, benefit to the cloud. The fifth concern, the fifth friction point by companies that are going to be going to the cloud. And when we start talking to them is how are they going to have control over the features that are being rolled out to the cloud instance? Because we just said they're, they're you know, updating things, they're making features. You don't have to do upgrades. They just happen in the cloud. And how will these organizations test those new features before they go live in their Atlassian cloud instance? So when we discuss migrating to the cloud, we talk about a strategy to reduce those concerns with strange, with change management. The first one is release tracks. Uh, release tracks is provided by Atlassian. It allows an organization to control when changes and new features are rolled out to their cloud instance so that there's a level of control there. For a sandbox, it receives changes a month before they're released into production, and it gives people a time to test, organizations time to test that. A production environment receives changes in a bundled group the second Tuesday of every month. So by using release tracks, an organization can say, don't just drop them into my environment. Let me do this on a planned cycle so that we have time to test that. 
Um, talking about testing, the second uh, feature that we recommend for this change management is a sandbox. A sandbox is a test cloud instance that's isolated. It's a copy of your production cloud instance. And because it's isolated, you can do testing of your upcoming cloud features before you implement those, before they get implemented into production. And the third is the Atlassian roadmap that's available for features that are upcoming on the cloud. And it's a good way to keep informed about upcoming features that are planned. So with that, let me turn it back over to Dave to talk more about the Atlassian roadmap. Yeah, um, so when it comes to the roadmap, once you all may have an opportunity to go out there and check it out, uh, Atlassian.com slash roadmap, you'll see that there's, you can toggle between a data center uh, and server roadmap, those still exist. Uh, but what we're really focused on is the cloud roadmap, right? And just knowing by, you know, just simply knowing what's coming, that helps us, um, helps, helps you rather uh, be able to plan around it. And now you see the, uh, the release tracks and the sandboxes that can help, uh, can certainly help you mitigate those, um, those changes. And again, prepare those changes. Things on the roadmap might be something small like, uh, being able to claim multiple user domains um, out of uh, out of your out of your resources for lasting access, or it might be something transformational like enabling generative AI within your entire environment, right? So knowing that that something like generative AI is coming at you uh, is great. Is a release track going to get you there? Right? Is just delaying two weeks going to be enough, or a month going to be enough to? for you to be able to get your business in shape or build a plan or strategy around actually leveraging the power of something like AI? Yeah, maybe, but probably not. So an extra level that's embedded within Atlassian Cloud for the admins is simply the ability to toggle on and off a transformative technology like AI. If you're not ready for it yet, if AI or um, some other kind of features like that you're not quite ready for the admin at the organization level, right? That top level within all of your uh, company's instances of Atlassian Cloud can choose when to toggle that feature on and off. And it's really more than a feature, but uh, mm -hmm. you can understand because it, it falls in the line of, of the features, if you will. So that that's become very important to have that level of, of control over the environment. Again, that doesn't mean you can toggle all of the different things on and off. There are some things that just obviously need to be there that come directly off of the roadmap, but you are able to plan, you know, for those release tracks and sandboxes as well. So that'd be another level of, of change mitigate, mitigation so mm -hmm. you can really make sure your users are in place. I think that ability to toggle is um, a, a lot of organizations are going to like that. So that's good to hear. Mm -hmm. All right. Let's talk about a summary of key points. Um, so today we talked about the five most common friction points that we hear from organizations when we start talking to them about migrating to the cloud, things that we hear as a partner and things that Atlassian hears as well. Um, so looking at this list here, we have feature parity. Um, the concern is feature parity. So what you know, the solution to that is analyzing the existing server and data center instance, make recommendations for apps to ensure that essential features remain on the cloud as they as close to as they are on the server or data center instance today. Uh, the downtime. So for the downtime during migration, we talked about a proactive approach to reduce the downtime, including server instance cleanup, pre-migrating users before the migration, um, and definitely doing that test migration to find any problems before we go to production. For security, we looked at a lot of points um, you know, a lot of concerns within the security realm and ways that Atlassian Cloud addresses those, such as data encryption and compliance with certain regulations. We reviewed how the cost of server and data centers more than just the cost of licenses. So once we looked at that total cost of ownership, cloud could be a lower cost solution for an organization and increase profitability because of the different um, features and productivity items that are available in the cloud. And the last one here was change management. We reviewed the use of release tracks and sandboxes and the Atlassian roadmap, as well as the toggles, is a way for organizations to help control the features that are being rolled out into their cloud instance. So this wraps up the presentation portion of our webinar. Let me turn this back over to Abhinit uh, with some important information from you, and then we'll go into the Q&A session.
Thank you, Alison. Hello, everyone, again. Uh, that was fantastic. We have ended our insightful webinar on five common friction points about Atlassian cloud migration. But I want to thank our speakers for sharing their expertise, Alison and Dave. Before we uh, wrap up, I have a special announcement for everyone who joined us live today. We are offering a free mini assessment exclusively to our live webinar attendees today. Uh, to access this valuable resource, simply scan the QR code on the screen. It's a small token of appreciation for your participation today. Uh, as a global Atlassian partner, we from ECO take pride in our role as cloud specialized partners. We are dedicated to helping organizations like yours, leveraging the power of Atlassian solution to drive success. If you are looking for guidance, support, or innovative solutions, ECOR is here to assist you. I mean, you we touched upon a whole variety of topics uh, that we can help you with. We're about to dive into a QA and a session now uh, where you can ask our experts any burning questions. So stick around and uh, let's make the most of this opportunity of uh, for knowledge sharing. Thank you for being part of this webinar and we look forward to continuing our partnership uh, in your pursuit of excellence with Atlassian, right? Uh, safe journeys ahead. Alison, back to you. Okay, thanks. Um, so let's go into the Q&A session. Um, so we're going to go through the questions that were presented in the Q&A room during the session. Um, so with Dave, do you want to start reading those yeah. questions off? And then let me know if you want me to answer, if you're going to answer. Yeah, sure. One of the One of the first questions that I saw here comes back to security which uh, is not surprising, top of mind for everybody <laughs> anytime we talk about cloud. Um, and it really goes back to, I'll kind of summarize, we've talked a lot about security, et cetera. What would Atlassian do if there was a security breach? Um, that's a really good question. You know, at, the short answer is we have a plan in place, right? There's an incident, a very well-documented incident response plan in place. Uh, you can actually find out more about it specifically at, uh, at our, in the trust area of Atlassian.com. You know, and that goes uh, from everything from, I believe we have five different levels of security or of, uh, of incidents definition, right? Those levels of security or the level of severity are documented as well as even a communication plan, um, you know, roles and responsibilities. And we have uh, staff and leadership in place, on place that, their full job is security incident response, uh, response time to our customer. So there is a proactive reach out would be, you know, one of the one of the top things. So there's a fully baked out plan. You know, that plan actually, when I, I answer a lot of information, InfoSec questionnaires over the course of time here, uh, that plan is is shared with folks at that time, the specifics of it. And we've gotten quite a good response to that. And it, it really does check all the boxes. Um, so that's a good question. I'll move on to the next one here. I've heard about eCord's role in migration. Uh, does Atlassian also have a role in this process? Allison, I think that one's probably best for you, if you wouldn't mind. Okay, sure. Um, so yes, um, we, as a solution partner, we reach out to Atlassian at certain points during the migration process. Um, um, customers will have an enterprise advocate or a loyalty advocate and we'll reach out to them that's been assigned to a given organization to assist us with any questions or issues that we have with billing and licenses, customer questions. They help us get those cloud licenses pulled. Uh, they work with us to help complete the security review that a lot of organizations require internally for them to be able to move to the cloud. Uh, the next one is on Atlassian Cloud Migration Manager. It's known as a CMM. That gets assigned as soon as we open a move ticket, which is our migration ticket. And what they do is they work closely with us on the migration run book, which is the migration plan to make sure that we have a smooth migration. If we have any unexpected issues, they help us get the technical resource to assist us. They're a single point of contact for any support needed, such as assistance with sandboxes. And this helps so we're not you know, trying to open tickets and do different things. As a partner, we get that dedicated support from the CMM. And then also for instances that have more than 10,000 users, 
Um, we also work with the CNM, CMM on a scalability assessment to make sure that um, everything's there to be able to support that size customer on the cloud. And then the third area is a support engineer, which is also an SE. And they they provide that technical support as needed for us and any escalation. So if we have technical problems or technical questions, then they're right there to assist us. And again, just like the CMM, we have a dedicated SE throughout an entire migration. So that person is familiar with the migration that we're working on. And yeah, you know, I, go I ahead. Mean, I, I was just gonna say, that's it. <laughs> yeah, as a, as a person, you know, as an Atlassian employee, uh, I know that I've been involved with you know, I continue to be involved with our customers and partners throughout a migration process. Everything from, and that might be from like the devi helping define value and understanding of the platform at the very beginning to get to that migration process, uh, get to that migration phase where there might be hiccups and additional planning and, and resources that need to be brought to bear. So, you know, definitely the last and folks are involved throughout that process. Glad to have them too. <laughs> cool. Um, Going to move on to another question here. Uh, yeah, it was good to hear that Atlassian Cloud can provide data residency. What regions can this be done for? Uh, Allison, I'm going to just have you take that one again. If you don't sure. Uh, we get this question a lot. So I check that page often. So um, data residency is provided now for EU, which is Franklin Dublin regions the United States, Germany, and then on the other side of the world, Australia and Singapore. Um, but it's important to note, it, to note that just because those are the ones that are su supported today, Atlassian's been very busy with um, extending data residency to other regions. And that's listed on that roadmap that we previously talked about. Um, and right now, the ones that are in planning to have data residency are Brazil, Canada, India, the UK, Switzerland, and in Asia, uh, Japan and South Korea. And I think it's good, like I said, to, to check that roadmap. If you have a specific region that you're worried about for data residency, keep an eye on that, and then you'll know when it is going to be released. Cool. Um, yeah, thanks for that, Allison. I'm looking at another question in the queue here. Uh, it looks like maybe I some curiosity when I was talking about toggling mm -hmm. features on and off because someone wants to know how do we know which cloud features uh, are available to toggle and if you all remember that would be that mm -hmm. you know that change change uh, the change mitigation process or managing excuse me managing the change throughout a migration uh, the there are other features right the other features that are available to toggle on and off really will be displayed to the admins in the admin console. Um, as they log in to their environment, right? So the same spot where admins are used to controlling user access and product, uh, maybe some product settings, um, that type of toggle ability will be presented to them there in that same admin console. So makes it uh, makes it nice and streamlined. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, any other, are you seeing any other questions in the QA maybe that I'm missing otherwise? I did not. It was the ones that she mentioned. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so if anybody has any questions after the call or we miss them on that channel, um, if you look at the bottom of this slide that I have up right here, you can see there's a marketing.na at ecore.com. If you have any other questions, please feel free to send your questions to that email and we will get back to you. And with that, let's go to that final slide, which is a thank you. I thank everybody for joining. Dave, it's been a pleasure working with you on this. Um, so thank you as well. Thank you all. All right. Thank you.